This is Peter Connor. I'm director of the Translation Center at Barnard College, and I'm joined today by Johannes Gorenson. Johannes teaches Swedish literature at the University of Notre Dame. He is himself a poet and an important translator of Swedish uh, poetry, and we're here today to talk about both those aspects of his work, his poetry, and his translations. Thank you for joining us, Johannes. Thanks for having me. If we're going to talk about Swedish poetry, it seems almost uh, obligatory to begin with Thomas Tranströmer, uh, whom everyone knows. And one thing I've always wanted to ask an expert is uh, whether or not uh, the dominance of Tranströmer on the uh, on the world scene of letters, let's say, uh, has tended to misrepresent uh, Swedish poetry in its uh, in all its breadth. Uh, Tranströmer is a meditative, contemplative kind of poet. Uh, you've written about the translations that have been produced by him. Robert Bly has been very important in this respect. And uh, I'd be curious to know, from your point of view, uh, the extent to which he remains a pertinent or representative figure on the Swedish poetry scene today. Well, I would say, first of all, that I don't believe in representative figures. And uh, I don't know if I have a very good... I don't know if it's possible or um, even uh, desirable to have a kind of representation. So I, I think, in that sense, he's fine. But your point is well taken because uh, he's a poet, uh, I would say, is, who, who is, has a kind of a popular presence in, Sw in Swedish culture, is fa famous. But Sw Swedish poetry overall... Um, has over the since the 1960s not been uh, all that transdermerish. I would say it. Uh, so in that sense, it's a, it's a misrepresentation. Um, it it ten, tends to be. I think the Swedish poetry has tended. I mean, it goes through different changes. So like, but transdermer debuted in the 50s, and in the 60s he became a kind of international figure through various translations like Bly, but in the 60s Swedish poetry uh, moved much more towards a kind of what they called new simplicity, which is a sort of, mar sort of mixture of Marxism and um, the, n uh, the new novel coming out of France and um, concretism and things like that. Mm. Uh, it's interesting that you, you mentioned the new novel already. We didn't get very far into the discussion without we can talk about the French. Uh -huh. And I know that you said uh, about, uh, or I read something you said about Tranströmer being influenced by what you call high surrealism, meaning the surrealism of, of uh, Char and Édouard, for example, rather than Breton or others. Uh, but I wonder, is that a point of continuity in the Swedish poetic tradition? Because so much of the poetry that you write and the poetry that you translate is also influenced by a certain kind of surrealism. Uh, yeah, I guess that would be continued. I mean, France, I think, has always been a very strong influence on Swedish poetry, and uh, as it has been an influence on a lot of uh, nations. Um, uh, uh, why France rather than Germany or the Anglo-Saxon tradition? Um, well, there has been some German influence too. I, I, uh, I mean, it's hard for me to say. I mean, this is something to do with the, the, just the prominence of France and its literature. It's, uh, I mean, it's, yeah, you know, if you want to go really historical, you know, Sweden, Sweden used to take its kings from France, and those were the guys who invented the idea of a national culture. So. Uh, might be that might just be that France has excellent writers. Might be that uh, France for a long time had such fer ferment. Um, but it's certainly true that uh, Transformers, Transformer, Ekelaf, all these people, Strindberg lived in France, yes. um, and yeah, Osa Osa Bay is also was a member of a surrealist group in Stockholm. Um, so obviously very influenced by a different, but a different part of surrealism, more of, more of the Arto Bataille wing. And, uh, I don't know. Right, that's interesting. <laughs> so, you, so you mentioned the name of the poet Osa Berra. Uh, 
who is uh, the poet whom you have perhaps most translated, not the mm -hmm. only one, but uh, you've translated uh, several works, for example, with Deer, also Remain Land, Selected Poems of Osebera, which is from Action Books, which is your own press, and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll talk about that surely later on. Transfer Fat from Ugly Duckling Press. Uh, and you mentioned again her connection with a certain kind of surrealism. Mm -hmm. Perhaps someone coming from the outside, as it were, and looking at Swedish poetry uh, might be mildly surprised to see the persistence of the influence of surrealism, even though in this case, as you say, it's not the high surreal surrealism that Transtromer uh, was reading, but uh, it's really the dissident surrealism. Yeah. Uh, so it's almost, in fact, the figures whom Breton ex excommunicated from the surrealist movement. It's the, mm -hmm. the wildest uh, figures, the, in a sense, the most marginal, Bataille, uh, Arthur, and so on. Uh, so a very different uh, kind of surrealism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, than the high surrealism of Charles and Éluard. Uh, do you feel that? Uh, do you feel particularly close to to also Bera uh, as a poet? Um, yeah, I mean, I've uh, not only have I. I mean, I've translated her partly because I really loved her work, and um, so there's already. I mean, I I didn't choose to translate her because she was. I felt. She, she was representative or anything like this, no scholarly thinking behind it merely because I loved it and I've, and it was, to me, when I came across it in the 90s, there was nothing like it in the U.S. and I wanted to kind of, being published, um, and then, you know, I started translating it to sort of give to my friends who I knew would like it, um, and that's, uh, so, yeah, no, she had a big influence on me, um, when I first, I mean, she continues to have a big influence on me, partly through her poetry, partly through the process of translation has had a big influence on me. Um, so, yeah, I feel. Uh, does her work present particular difficulties with regard to the translation? The work Transfer Fat, for example. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I mean, it's especially the, um, the later poems uh, become incredibly involved in knotting up and deforming the Swedish so that it's full of puns and not even puns, it's more of a sort of, an, uh, sort of a process that accumulates resonances and echoes and the Swedish language itself begins to look very odd and foreign even as it is uh, still Swedish. So the it's a very slippery or excessive text to begin with. So, puns and neologisms and all these things make it a just it makes it very hard, but hard in a really interesting way. And I think that's the key. People always say, "I can't believe you you translate you translated for Lafette. That seems like an impossible book to translate." But that is part of what makes it so interesting, and that's what makes me. And it r raises questions of translation that have been really influential for me just from the process of trying to translate this very dynamic and excessive text. Uh, I wonder, can you say a word about the relation between your translations and your own poetic production? Uh, how, how one relate, relates to the other? Well, uh, yeah, I mean... P um, to begin with, I think translation is this you know incredibly close, at times myopic reading process that will trains trains or leads you or misleads you into reading in ways I think that are uh, might be seen as pathological or uh, myopic, and that that obviously influences the way I write or the way I think about literature. Um, one of the things that you deal with as through once you become aware of translation discussions about translation in America, um, become aware of how problematic it is in American literature and the way it's discussed. That is something I have had to. So that's something I've had to think about, and that comes out naturally if you're a bilingual person. I think um, you have a 
culture which is so sus suspicious of translations. Um, what if you or yourself are living, uh, you know, in, in part living with other texts that are somehow not allowed into the culture or into the definition of what a poem is, that I think will lead you inevitably to question these kind of um, traditional ideas of what the poem is. So, if, po if, if you're, you're bilingual and you come to somebody tells you basically that poetry is what's lost in translation, you can either say, okay, I will have to suppress these sort of translations that are already going on in my life and which I will naturally uh, come to, or you have to start questioning the, the idea of what the dominant paradigms for poetry is. And so that has been fruitful for me to question. <laughs> I decide, I'm, I'm a very uh, stubborn person and so I was not willing to uh, forget about half of my life. <laughs> Maybe you could say a little bit about your life. Uh, you, you speak as a bilingual, mm -hmm. bicultural person, and that's because you were born in Sweden. Uh, you were born in particular in uh, which town? Oh, I was born in Lund, in yes. southern Sweden. Mm -hmm. uh, and you lived there until? I was 13. 13, and then you came to America. Mm -hmm. Are you a more Americanized Swedish poet than the... Swedish poets who have remained in Sweden, do you think, in your own poetry? Is my poetry more American? It, some? Yes. Uh, I'm, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to say what is um, American, but it's written in English, so... Um, and clearly I have... I have, uh, you know, I, but I participate in a lot, with a lot of American poetry, I teach American poetry, I have a PhD in American poetry. But on the other hand, I mean, I don't know if you I don't know if you have a follow-up question. I was just wondering how, to the extent to which you might have been sedu seduced by American culture in a way that would be different from uh, people in Sweden, in Sweden receiving that culture from a certain distance. Yeah. You're very much yeah. uh, integrated into the American cultural scene. And you say you write in English, moreover. You don't write in Swedish as well? Uh, I do write in right. Swedish. So too. the Swedish texts that are in your volumes, along with the English texts, are your own versions. Yeah. But mm -hmm. they're subsequent to it. It's, first, it's always first of all English? No, no, no. Now no, that is a book that, you're holding a book called Pilot. That is a book that I partly was generated by my work as a translator, because at some point, the way translation works, and especially uh, translation of somebody like Osa Bay, who's all these, got all these puns, is that it seems to generate all this excessive, excess language matter, and I couldn't really put those in the translations, that sort of energy, because it wouldn't be Osa's work anymore. It's more like the act of translation generated all these other translate the impulses or energies and that is like to write a book out, out, out from those energies um, so a lot of that actually comes from translated texts that are not included um, so I would translate for example old pop songs from the 80s that I remember from Sweden into English but I would use these really deformative translation techniques so you wouldn't exactly be able to recognize most of them um, or I would translate things in English, like at the time uh, my wife was pregnant and we were having a kid and so I translated a lot of these pregnancy manuals. There's so much writing that comes along with pregnancy, all these rules and pamphlets and stuff, so that came into it and I would translate that into Swedish and then I might translate back into English, use things similarly, uh, kind of incredibly, what you say, unfaithful methods mm -hmm. uh, and then I would go back and forth. But I do, I mean, even in my other books, I do a lot of work. I'm interested in what happens when you move between the languages and how it estranges you in interesting ways from both English and, Swe and Swedish. So that's something that happens just automatically, I think. Um, but what was your question? Uh, well, we were talking about... Oh, seducing. Pilot. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I'm seduced... Uh, by American poetry, and I'm seduced by Swedish poetry. Um, I don't feel like I... Uh, I'm not interested in distance, so I'm not interested in critical distance. Uh, yeah, I'm seduced by things all the time, and uh, especially art, so... Uh, but yeah, a lot of Amer Amer I mean, Swedish poets are, are 
very well read in American poetry on the whole. So I don't know if they're seduced by it, but they are aware of it. They're very well read. So the book pilot, Johann the Carousel Horse, is described as a book of nursery rhymes gone wrong in translation. I don't know who said that, your publicist or yourself. Um, you seem to be unaware of that. Yep. The nursery rhymes gone wrong in okay, translation. That's a lovely that, idea. Yeah. Uh, and these nursery rhymes, uh, they're very uh, broad in scope. There's quite a, a great, there's a great deal of interest in the post-colonial condition, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the post-colonial mm -hmm. sublime, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, those are traces that I might have suspected you uh, uh, you abs absorbed in the American part of your experience. Oh yeah, no, I mean, I should clarify. I was not writing poetry when I left Sweden, so this is uh, this is uh, no. Well, but this I was not reading post-colonial no, theory. No, <laughs> that's right. So, uh, the American years were formative educational years. Mm -hmm. You were in high school, and then in college. Yeah, and then in graduate school. Yeah. Is uh, there okay. is there any t tension between your sense of yourself or your identity or whatever you want to call it as a poet and as a professor, as someone within the institution, as it were? Oh, is, are there tensions between it? I, yeah, I mean, I would hope so. I feel very tense a lot. <laughs> I, I'm a very tense person, so um, that's certainly true. Not the same kind of. I don't have the. I don't have the kind of anxieties a lot of people have about institutionalization. Um, I have. T yeah, maybe I have tensions, but I tend to not tend to be the person. I'm so tense that I don't uh, try to hide that in some way. Um, I, I, teaching is... Um, I love teaching. Um, before I taught, I worked as a landscaper, and teaching, I think, is... While landscaping was interesting, fascinating, in a lot of ways, teaching is much preferable to be able to just disappear into discussions about art that's what I like to do so uh, but yeah of course there are I mean issues involved in uh, being in an institution and so on uh, uh, I'd like to ask you if you would be so kind to read a poem of mm -hmm. your choice uh, from one of the volumes we have on the table. Mm -hmm. If I asked you to do so, would one come to mind? Uh, I can read something from that since you just were well, talking about So, from Pilot. All right, so I can read these two poems. They are sort of translations, and they're very short. So this one, first one is called A Camera Cut with Glass. The pig empty starlet does not belong in our repulsionography, but I have rinsed her for the carousel. Her limbs are free. We can be heroes on the floor and electrically far away from horses. Utsvartning rit kretsen. Den gris tumma stjärnan hör inte hemma i detta äckelskrinet. Jag har rensat av henne för karusellen. Hennes armar är fria nu. Vi kan bli hjältar på golvet och långt ifrån kälhästar. So, that's a sort of translations. For example, horses became kälhästar. And käl means sort of like pet horses. Mm -hmm. like that. Uh, one thing that strikes me when I read your poetry and when I read uh, also various poetry in your translation is uh, the uh, the violence of the imagery, to use a, a, a reductive term, no doubt. It's mm -hmm. very complex. Uh, in your own case, this seems in some places to come uh, via Arto. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous uh, uh, amount of... Uh, of morselation of the body, of, of explosion of the, of the body. The body is unrecognizable, in, in a sense, or uh, blown apart. Uh, is, that, is it fair to say that Artaud is the dominant figure, at, at least in the collection pilot? Uh, 
for uh, it. Maybe it's October. Maybe it's also George W. Bush. You know, so. Uh, <laughs> could be either <laughs> one of them. Um, but yes, I love Artaud's work. I, um, so that's really important to me. Yeah. Uh, Both the theater, uh, theater right. stumble, so, and the and the theater of cruelty, probably. And the, and the yeah. cruelty might be a better word than violence. Yeah, uh, yeah. to describe uh, uh, the sentiment that I that I feel when I read these poems. Yeah, that's probably right. I mean. Uh, I mean, like I said, it might be George W. Bush. I mean, it's uh, we live in a very, we live in a violent world. So that, I mean, that's the the cheesy answer I can give you. But I am also interested in the way the violence, like in Artaud, how it's related to a kind of mediumizing of the body. Uh, so that is some right, which is rela- related for you to translation mm-hmm. for you and also. Uh, for your wife, uh, Joelle McSweeney, with whom you've written uh, a work on translation. Your, uh, your title is Translation Wounds, and you speak there about uh, translation as a wound and also about something that, uh, that Joelle McSweeney speaks about in her part of the work, the body possessed by media. Uh, would you like to say a word about what you were thinking when you began to think about translation as a wound? Um, I, I would say that it actually comes... I mean, in some ways, I'm think, I think of art as a kind of wound or some kind of wounding enterprise. Um, what made me think about translation as a wound in that for that particular piece was on part, like I say, uh, Daniel Tiffany's discussion of um, the kind of necro... necrotic history of translation discourse. That was one of the elements, the idea of reanimating a corpse. Like this is this is really how you think not only of translation but also of foreign literature. <laughs> right, a, it, must, so, yeah. it must be it must be a, a foreign as a zombie there is you know, it's a corpse. And then the other thing that I thought about that I bring in there is Carolyn Forche's very influential book of antho- anthology of um, poetry in translation uh, I, Against Forgetting, I think it's called. Uh, but for many people, it's like the most canonical text of work, uh, poetry, modern poetry and t- translation. I thought it was fascinating that it has to, t- that the way you can write, you can read poetry and translation has to do with uh, very explicitly about victims of genocide and, and um, war. Like th- this is how translation can come to us. Um, this is how you can. But, I mean, in one way, it's a very containing idea. Like, okay, you ha- she in her introduction, she talked about you have to be a direct victim of genocide, and there has to be the right level of genocide, and you have to have the right kind of victim, and this is why they're allowed to write such weird stuff. We're not allowed because we're not involved. Of course, we are. I mean, this is sort of like a, an attempt to contain uh, an aesthetic. Uh, but the interesting thing about translation there is that it w- does work like a wound. Is, you, you, she she can't contain those poems in the, with that model. Um, it has been very influential, and um, there are plenty of American poets who have read these kind of poets like Vasco Popa and Paul Celan, and the, that that frames just can't contain the art, and the art has leaked out of this frame or and it has also wounded them in returns um, so I mean yeah this is art itself to me is violent uh, that's part of what why I'm, that's something that's interesting about art it's violent and violence tends to be artistic I mean, this, so this is what I think about a lot of time um, there's a lot of prudishness in American poetry about you're not supposed to aestheticize violence, you're not supposed to aestheticize suffering. This is kind of what makes Carolyn Forche, I think, so nervous in her introduction, because she has all these poems about violence and uh, torture and suffering, and but you're not supposed to make art, because that somehow is supposed to make 
it's frivolous in some way. Art makes things frivolous. That's a very common idea behind this in American discussions. But I think I think exactly the opposite. I think there's already art in violence. I think art is violent, and uh, I don't think that art makes things frivolous. I think, if anything, I think the opposite. So I think you should definitely. I don't have, I have no problems. I have no problems about writing about violence and and uh, murder and melee. So. Swedish poetry, since Transtromer, has become increasingly, or has passed through a, a moment of politicization mm -hmm. uh, in the 60s, I think, mm -hmm. already with the uh, war in Vietnam and uh, uh, the general sense that U.S. imperialism needed to be countered in very explicit ways in poetry. Uh, do, you, do you feel uh, yourself to be uh, an inheritor of that? that tr tradition of politicized action? It's an interesting question in the context mm -hmm. of the surrealist influence. Uh, they too wondered about the, uh, the political valency of mm -hmm. art and uh, there's sometimes a tension between different members of, those, of that group uh, between art as, a, as an autonomous uh, independent act and uh, art in the service of the revolution. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you might be more on the side of art in the service of the, re of the revolution. Well, I, the, the Swedish poetry of the 60s and a lot of this sort of what, what somebody might call like instrumentalizing ideas of poetry um, leads to some, to me, just some really boring poetry. And the Swedish poetry of the 1960s, I, on the whole, find with glimpses in like concretism or Lars Norén's early work, I don't know, a lot of it I think is pretty boring. Um, I don't think the art for its, it, I don't believe in that binary either, art for art's sake versus art for the revolution. Art for its own sake is revolutionary. Art in itself is incredibly powerful. Uh, art in itself is something that seems to deeply trouble people, which is why you're not supposed to aestheticize suffering, you're not supposed to aestheticize violence. I think it's all right because it's, there's something very dynamic and um, troubling and interesting and exhilarating and ecstatic and disturbing about art in itself so it has a power in of itself it's, and like you mentioned earlier it's a power that seduces and it's a power that repels it has these powers and to merely make it in I mean I, I have a problem with a lot of these sort of instrumentalizing ideas of poetry or art because um, it seems like a way of trying to what I call it like redeem art you make it it's for our edification it's a for uh, it is for a purpose it's but exactly in its not purpose, I think it's its power. Um, so a lot of times, I mean, a lot of discussions I'm involved with in contemporary poetry, they always try to make it into it's a critique, it's this, it's that, it subverts. Every academic conference, every poem subverts the critiques. But in that process, to me, they seem to want to redeem it, to make it uh, useful in a way that I, I find not interesting. So I guess I'm, I want to say that I'm... I'm neither of those two, I guess. But of course, there's all diff different kinds of ways of aestheticizing. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to read you a quotation from It's Not Acceptable to Be a Fatso, which is, which is a text you know, no doubt, uh, of uh, Osa Berry's. Uh, she says a wonderful thing. Uh, she says, I hope for poetic expressions that are aggressive, baroque, and esoteric. I prefer ridiculous and embarrassing to perfection. On the literary market, which is dominated by the aesthetic and social ideals of the upper middle class, it is unacceptable to be excess excessive in any way. One adjective too many, and you're out. The fleshy, screamy, and overdone, the vulgar, desperate, and pathetic are so taboo in our culture that there must be a dog buried in the phenomenon. So, dog buried in the phenomenon uh, is a, an idiom I understand from Swedish, meaning uh, there's a rat. Yeah, you can smell somewhere. a rat. Yeah. Uh, but th the point is very clear. Uh, and it paints a picture of Swedish society that might seem familiar to, to many people who perceive Sweden from the outside, that uh, it's a, a cosseted welfare mm -hmm. state, really doing quite well. Uh, such that uh, one, one wonders uh, about its need for the poetic word. 
when everything is still fine. This is a, a simplistic reduction of things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it produces this need to scream mm -hmm. uh, and to be ridiculous and to be embarrassing and so on. Uh, uh, I wonder if, if that's still an accurate picture of Sweden. We have all kinds of fantasies and projections oh, yeah. about Sweden. No. And it, it must have considerably changed from the 60s, from the 70s and so on, just simply because of demographic movements that will have brought in populations from other parts of Europe and other parts of the world that will have changed its makeup. It's, but that idea was, I think, is a fantasy to be, I mean, it's a fantasy already, obviously. Um, there's a fantasy about the welfare state, but the Swedes had a fantasy about the welfare state too. I should say that I'm often very critical of the welfare state ideology, but I have to say that it was very nice to grow up in the welfare state, you know, nobody had to worry about, there was no homelessness, you know, yada yada, it was pretty nice, we had insurance, we had schools, but it was also, I mean, it was also a fantasy even at that point. Um, also, I don't think there is that, I noticed that a lot in Americans, they tend to think, to think of Swedes as like spoiled, or like we live the, uh, Swedes live an easy life, and so my, life is still complex and interesting, even if you have insurance. Also, I mean, also, I mean we were comparatively not, I mean, Sweden has never been a rich country. I mean, Sweden has tend to be a very poor country, and certainly when, during the heydays of the welfare state, if that was the 1970s, we, uh, I mean, think, I think uh, we're, we're not living like rich Americans, you know, we basically, it's like a, it was a different thing, but I think it's actually part, this fantasy is actually intrigues me a lot. Um, it, what Sweden represents to Americans is really fascinating to me. But one of them seems to be a kind of zombie, uh, unemotional, cold, and this, I think, goes together with this idea of the welfare state is everything has been taken care of we don't need any you don't need art you know and as a result Swedes can't be creative Swedes can't have emotions and we, that fulfills some kind of fantasy in the American culture too of, which tend to think of itself as you know rebellious and individualistic and romantic so you need that other and strangely that has become that is um, the Swedes which is such a peripheral <laughs> figure I mean in the world um, but so, yeah, I mean, I, it's an interesting figure, and uh, I pay attention to it, and uh, I'm intrigued by it. Um, and, um, the other day I read this book about indie rock in the 80s, and one paragraph said something like, these young bands um, started their own labels, and they were expressive, and they rebelled against capitalism and major labels, and Swedish Stoicism. I was like, wh one of these things are not like the other. Somehow these uh, immigrants are standing in for something that's uh, that seems to be oppressive uh, for Americans. I think they were talking about the replacements because they grew up in Minnesota and obviously are Swede Swedish descendants. But it's like it's crazy. And uh, the other day I read uh, there was a poem in the, in the New Yorker of all fine publications which were had this figure of the idiot Swedes who were doing things and and they sort of they're this multitude again and they're idiots and which actually goes back to ethnic an ethnic slur from the 19th century in Minnesota where they call them the dumb Swedes and obviously they were uh, not welcomed in, into society in Minnesota but anyway so yes I'm intrigued by this fantasy and um, I note it and it's inter it's a fantasy there's another fantasy which is the Swedish fantasy about itself uh, which I also obviously might be participating in here uh, or, or dealing with. Um. You also translate Swedish poetry produced in Finland, which is uh, something I think we know even less about than we might know mm -hmm. about Swedish literature. Uh, is it, uh, it, could you describe uh, its difference, if there is a difference, vis-à-vis -vis Swedish uh, literature produced by Swedes born in Sweden? Uh, <clears throat> well, it's a, di a totally different ethnicity. Uh, it's the Finland Swedes. So they're Finnish, but they have a f Swedish speaking ethnic background, except they're also a very, it's a very permeable ethnic group. They tend to think of themselves as very, you know, her I think 
kind of they think of themselves as more complete than I think historically they have been. They seem to a lot of different ethnic groups seem to kind of flow through them as a result of the Russian and Swedish imperialist ventures there. Uh, so, you know, Finland was owned by it was ruled by Sweden for a long, long time, and then it was ruled by Russia, and it didn't really have its own language, official language. Finnish wasn't an official language until I think 1918, when it gained its independence from Russia. So they, it's an ethnic group. They're very fascinating. I find. Uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on Finland, Swedes, Finland, Swedish literature, but. I think throughout the 20th century has been a really fascinating group of writers, especially in the 1920s. This is like, to me, to my mind, one of the most radical moments of modernism are the Finland-Swedish modernists, which is amazing because they're this tiny little group, ethnic group, uh, but partly because of this, all the, like I'm talking about Finland-Swedes being very international because there are all these people kind of moving through it. They were so much more in touch with all kinds of radical movements in Russia, because they were part of Russia, but also in Germany, in Sweden. And uh, there's just like, you know, there's just a handful of them are, uh, you know, 10, 15 poets, basically. And they are extremely radical, maybe in part because of their, on one hand, connection to the world, and on one hand, a sense of insularity. So, so basically, mostly I'm talking about Henry Parlin and Gunnar Bjarling, but there are other people like Dictonius and... Uh, Edith Sertagon. Henry Parland, uh, you've translated uh, Ideals Clearance, again for Ugly Duckling Press. Uh, He's a very interesting figure linguistically to begin with. uh, uh, Swedish was his fourth language, I believe, Mm -hmm. because of his various displacements. Uh, Is there... Uh, a palpable difference between the use of Swedish in Finnish Swedish poet, poets or writers and Swedish. Can you sense something different? Yeah, there is. There, it's a slightly. It's like a dialect. I would say. I hope I didn't say something politically incorrect there. But it's that's how I think of it. Parlin himself, like you said, that's not his native language. So, um, so he's maybe not a good example. Yeah. But. He, in fact, like Bjarling is in the letters are always from the era. I was complaining that he needs to work on his Swedish. So, <laughs> so it's uh, in the use of particular words that would be uh, local words, or it's, it's also yes. in terms of mm-hmm. sy- syntax. Yeah, I you know I can't tell you about the syntax. I mean I'm sure there is a study out there, but yeah, the, I think there is a slight difference. And then there's a word. There are words. I, um, that are not the same, and obviously slang words, and, uh, yeah. Uh, Let me ask you then, just in concluding, about your own use of language, or the English language. Uh, Does it bear traces of your Swedish, uh, your first language? You're obviously perfectly, as you say, bilingual and so forth, but when you write poetry, I'm just wondering, is there any interference on occasion, or do you you allow for, or even wish for, uh, a, a... a foreignizing or defamiliarizing effect that might come from I, your I would say that early it, days. I mean, the, I think that if you're bilingual, you do, they're not exactly two different languages. I don't think it is exact. I mean, for me, it's not like I'm choosing a language or switching from one. Um, this, the translation happens somewhat more seamlessly than that. But I am interested in. The way one of them affects the other. So if I can read, like pilot, a lot of times it's sort of like reading English through Swedish, or Swedish through English. The kind of noises that happen there, I think, are uh, very. I'm interested in those. I'm not interested in obli- even though I just said they're part of the same language. But also, I'm very interested in what happens to words when they go through those. There might be. St- the very words that they produce through translation, or it might be just like a different angle you have on a on a word or a language. Um, often, I find I've if once I you know if you if I read a lot of Swedish, or you go to the English, and it does seem does make it you read it differently at that point. Um, Pilot is is a very interesting book in terms of its structure, mm-hmm. moreover, because there are poems in Swedish and there are poems in English, but they don't necessarily match up, as right. though there's some kind of a mismatch there or an impossibility of equivalence. Uh, 
Uh, sometimes the the poem in Swedish is not facing the poem in English. Sometimes there's a poem in Swedish that is not present in English. Uh, sometimes the translation seems only partial. Uh, that's kind of rather disorienting in an interesting and stimulating way as a as a reader, even if one doesn't know Swedish, to be plunged into this uh, slightly antagonistic uh, bilingual space. That was obviously well. Thank you. That that was that was what I was going for. I didn't want it to be. I didn't. I wanted it to be a sense of them being translations, but I didn't want it to be a stable relationship. And that's not how I how I wrote them. Like I said, one of the impulses behind writing them was to just follow this kind of excess linguistic energies from the act of translation and just going with it. So rather than having feeling like I had to represent the poem in a correct the original in a correct way. So it, it's all written in that space of the excess linguistic, what I'm call, right now calling the excess linguistic energy. Um, and that's not meant to be a, a stable or um, st- a kind of stable space. It's supposed to be a kind of antagonistic, troubling uh, space, but also not a space... Um, not a, it's not supposed to be about translation. It's supposed to be in that space that translation opens up. Like it's written in there, and I want to take, go into that place as a sort of bilingual uh, melee. Um, I mean, also I arranged it, like you said, so that some of them would line up and some of them wouldn't. I mean, the original manuscript had many, many more poems too. So you, there are a lot of them in there that. I started with and I would translate them and I would only give you the last or I would take the middle one or I would only take the first poem. So um, it's sort of an outtake and that's why I'm, I'd call it pilot because it's a it's a reference to, you know, like the pilot episode of a sitcom or something like this where, uh, like I really like David Lynch's Twin Peaks. That was very influ- influential. I mean, there's the pilot episode that doesn't quite line up with the rest of the show because I think, in, uh, and there's all... It's always like, well, you show the pilot, and maybe you'll they'll, the channel will sign on for the rest of the show, or it might not. So there are all these other episodes of pilot, <laughs> pilots, pi- than the pilot episode. This particular one is Johan the Carousel Horse, um, and it's out there. And uh, unfortunately, NBC did not uh, <laughs> sign up for the other episodes, but they're out there in this ghosty space. Well, I hope that some of the listeners might want to read it. It, it, it really is. A uh, very dynamic book because of that peculiar structure, and it escapes that idiotic uh, uh, structure of uh, simply bilingual editions, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. are very, very difficult to read and rather depressing to read. Uh, I always feel uh, disheartened when I look at a straightforward bilingual edition with one language on one page and one language on the other, because the invitation is then to to rush to a kind of uh, comparative judgment, uh, which always is negative in its essence, uh, mm-hmm. looking for deficiencies or oddities in, in, a, in a suspicious, finicky kind of way. Whereas here, one has denied that possibility, and that denial was very liberatory. I found. Oh, well, thank you. No, I know. I mean, there's never been a review of a translated book that did not mention the mistakes. Really? Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. That, so they yeah. Didn't get it. It's like that's the only way we have a re- reviewing translation is to yes. is to look at the original, look at the other ones. Like, well, here I found a mistake. Right. And that I mean that is so conservative. The effect is so paralyzing and conservative. Right. Yeah. Well, it's because the the book is itself uh, an attempt to generate a productive kind of criticism of translation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Johannes. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's been very enlightening. Thanks. Thank you for all your questions.